Clinch with Greg Nelson and Team Academy, where we tackle and grapple everything martial arts. Hey, first want to give a shout out to Zebra Mats at zebraathletics.com, right? WTBA at tieboxing.com, Gurdan Anasanto, Anasanto.com, Eric Paulson at CSW at ericpaulson.com, and Pedro Sauer at pedrosauer.com, and the Academy at theacademymn.com. Okay, great. Uh, so today um, we have Caitlin Young here, one of our uh, longtime uh, athletes and, and coaches, along with myself, uh, Andy Gron, Matt McIntyre. And we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of um, and the history of combat sports um, from, you know, basically in the 90s until today. But, you know, pre-1990, uh, Greg, you want to like chime in here at any moment, um, you know, we had all these different sort of uh, separate st martial arts styles, really. You know, there was an evolution of JKD, but there was, you know, Thai boxing, and there was a little bit of uh, volley judo and catch wrestling, and, and judo was definitely a sport, but, and, and wrestling, for sure. Yeah, I remember coming back from, obviously, Thailand the first time in 1989, and that's what really, you know, where I saw competition of Thai box at the highest level, and we've you know, saw it in videos and stuff, but then seeing it and seeing how it was fought and trained with those people and then going, wow, we got to, we got to change things a little bit here. And so that was kind of the, my beginnings in really seeing Thai boxing and where we could go with it. And at that point in time, there was like zero Thai boxing in the United States as far as competition. It was all above the waist kickboxing. We had some leg kick fights, you know, going on, but and boxing, of course, but there wasn't Thai boxing, period, at all. And that really, for us, started in 1993, mm -hmm. in that summer when we first did it in Chicago. And then there was other spots going on because Fairtex was coming up at that point. And there was Were other, they even having full rules, though? Uh, you couldn't elbow. No. Yeah. yeah, like even you could, then, you, you couldn't, couldn't even elbow. You could, you know, we didn't have well, pads no on. No shin pads. No shin pads. Yeah, yeah you, could that. you could knee. You could kick. You could punch. But no, but no elbows. elbows. Well, even when I was amateur, still, uh, now they've changed it a lot with the TBA, but you, now you have elbow pads as an amateur so you can work it. But even then, it used to just be no elbows, period, or just to the body. So yeah, it's completely yeah. left out of the game. Which is kind of the almost exact opposite of fighting NHB back then because you could headbutt and elbow yeah. and knee and, and foot stomp knuckle. and bare knuckle. I mean, it was like everything goes. And, you know, it was a little bit more chaotic and crazy. And there was no weight class. commissions, no weight classes. And so at one end, you had Thai boxing, which they limited what you could do. And then you had NHB, mm -hmm. which you could do dang near anything. Right. And um, what do you want to talk a little bit about? Ju judo has been a sport since, you know, the, the 60s. I mean, it's been an Olympic sport, I think, since the 60s. But, um, you know, the development of that into, like, modern grappling, uh, IBGJF uh, and whatnot. Um, but back in the day, you did judo, too, right? And, and mm -hmm. you know, the training style back then was, was quite a bit different. Yeah, I mean, with Yuri coming in, Sensei Yuri, he was such a stickler for technique and repetition and repetition and going for it and then you know you would show basic stuff like leg locks and then you'd have each other and basically both have achilles and it was go and see who was going to get each other in a foot lock and that was that's how you, you kind of trained it and of course he, he showed technique and stuff what to do but there was so much of that contested you know, we're going to put you in an isolated position and we're just, you're just going to go full out, see who can get to foot locks. All right. And then there was a lot more striking. He did tons of striking. There was a joke that we called, called it shoot wrestling, right? Because he would do this long footwork drill, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of footwork. Then we'd start doing striking and then doing tie pads. Then we'd get on the ground and then he'd say time and everybody would go, oh, shoot. Because we'd have to end class and nobody would get to grapple because he was, you know, and then, yeah, you know, it's changed a little bit. And he was time. a student of 
Satoru Sayama. Satoru Sayama. Mask, and, and from what I've seen, you know, it was pretty brutal. Brutal. Yeah. So one of the guys hitting his students with like a stick. Yeah. And, yeah. and Yuri obviously that? wasn't as brutal as that, but he would, man, his ability, everybody thinks about his lock flows, but his ability to hit was, man, he could hit hard. And he didn't pull back too much. So you, so you, I, I do remember back in the day that you and David Leach would put each other in an inverted heel hook and see who tapped first. And that was, you know, that was really the initial kind of like, let's figure out this grappling stuff. But then, you know, you started learning more the pure jiu-jitsu from Pedro Sauer. And, um, you know, the, since then until now, it's improved quite a bit, right? Like you see people coming in and, yeah, what I, what I training's a lot better. really found with Professor Sauer is that he was so into the detail of technique that it really changed how I looked at all martial arts. You know, it was like so much detail, so much focus on precision and not being so crazy and really slowing down and isolating things and step-by-step -step technique, which changed the way I looked at Thai boxing, changed the way I looked at even wrestling changed the way I looked at almost everything. And of course, the whole time you have Guru Dan Anasanto, who was continually on the was on the cutting edge of finding the next person, the next person, the next art, and his whole take on creativity and absorbing what is useful and rejecting what is useless and adding what's specifically on. So that's always been in there. So we've always had that creative mindset and training uh, mentality. So that's also been huge in our I think our development as an overall school as far as fighting goes so you know when you think about like our the history of like our competition team Thai boxing um, and, and mixed martial arts back in the day a lot of the stuff was you know you just had to kind of figure it out and um, when I look at it now uh, and how people train now it's it's just much more scientific and, and much better um, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that. Like human performance in general um, has improved. People are, and I feel like even at a faster rate, people are figuring things out. It's it's just better in general. Well, it's or, cheat codes, I think. Like, you know, the person who goes before him figures out like, oh, I wish I would have known this, you know, five years earlier or whenever. <laughs> so you pass on the cheat codes so they don't have to learn it the hard way or from from their own fights, they can learn it, learn it from your fights. Yeah. And then, no, and then awesome. go from there, they don't have to redo it. Well, I think going to Thailand too has been one of those, Absolutely. like for me, like that was, you know, I just did what you and Rick did and then, you know, you went to Thailand and you brought back stuff and then went to Thailand again and then when I finally went to Thailand and, and was able to train there and saw how they trained, like just the, the vibe and the feeling doing it just helped me see more clearly, I think, how, how how it should be done. The more you know, although they do do, do some stuff over there that is, I still yeah. I question some some of this stuff. But uh, it seems like the more people that that you see doing it, there's just more and more doors opening up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now I mean, there's so much more access, right? Too with the internet. Access. You know, we talk about yes. Evolution, like you can see where you want to train. You can go on a forum and see if it's a good place to train. I mm -hmm. mean, I know. Uh, and now this is becoming kind of common knowledge, but you don't. If you want to go there and really learn a lot, it's not that you can't at a tourist gym. You can, but it's not the same thing as going to a Thai gym with stadium fighters. Um, and that's a, a big distinction in terms of how you're going to be pushed and just how much detail is going to be uh, left in there, I guess, instead of kind of glossed over. And just, just you know, because some people do want to just go to the beach and hang out and have a yeah. workout. And that's just fine. But, but if you're in the mix with all the fighters clenching and, and training. I think that's where you honestly pick up a lot is yes. watching them train, watching their technique, not just doing it yourself, you know, which you can do with a Thai trainer at a Farang gym. But if you go to a Thai gym and you can watch the way they're doing it, it helps you absorb more, I think. Did you, so when you were there, did you, how was the language barrier? Because what's interesting to me is now we have cell phones and we can we can basically talk and forth with Google Translate really easy. And that was not, when I was there, I couldn't do that. Yeah. So. Did you do that? Uh, not a lot, just because the Thai language is so hard. So on really basic things, it was better. But the first year I went was by myself. And Ajahn Surat speaks a little, but not uh -huh. a lot. So it was like I couldn't ex 
you, you know, the hardest thing is the <laughs> yeah. tenses, right? Like past and present. So trying to explain when I had to be there to weigh in. Yeah. Like I couldn't. So I was, it'd be <laughs> tough to do as a new student because, yeah. you know, if you've been doing it a while, you don't mind going to weigh ins by yourself and just being like, hey, here. And just mm -hmm. handing them a, a flyer about when to be there. But, um, so that was difficult. But the thing is with fighting, if you've been training for a while, it's really easy to, to learn by watching. Mm -hmm. True. And sort of doing True. the dances and wolves so you figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I went there in 1989 and I went to uh, Saint-Pantelet, I was the first white dude to ever be in that gym. Yeah. And they were just like, at first, oh, this is good. Fortunately, I did a bunch of Greco, so at least when two feet were on the ground, I did okay. Mm -hmm. And But as soon as I obviously lifted up my leg, I got chucked around. But I was able to survive a little bit better, and plus I was in such good shape that I could just push and push and push. But just watching those guys, and that's get what was so awesome to me was going there, and then you're clinching with somebody that's definitely smaller. And then you get just thrown, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, wow, so cool. this is so awesome. This yeah, is that's, a technique. That's something you can't describe over yeah. a podcast. You know, so for the listeners out there, if you can, go to Thailand. Yeah. Go to a good gym. It's and not get strength around either. in the, cl no. in the no. clinch. It was so funny because I it feels like, like I, the opposite of strength. Yeah, I remember when I had both feet on the ground. That was a, that was Greco, but as soon as you lift one foot up, the entire dynamic changes. Yes. Now, you your balance is different. Where your shoulders are is different. You're not di disguising how you're moving, and they just feel that so fast. And it is step in, and you're flying somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's something I think that's really important to know. Like, we all know that with jujitsu, right? You're not going to learn jujitsu by just going to class and just doing the technique. You have to spend a lot of time rolling. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of clinch, and they're really good about that. They're, um, probably depends what gym you're at, but Desert's a clinch-heavy gym, so they'll do 30 minutes straight of clinch after each training session. And mm -hmm. that's where you develop the, the feel, and I think that's actually something we're doing really well here, is spending a lot of time actually clinching instead of just doing the technique. And you I think that's teach. weird. Almost and that little well, no, the feel, the but the attitude to the Thai style, have fun and play. play. What you're doing. Yeah. yeah, you're in the lab. Yep. And that keeping that, you know, like like the Gracie Academy, keep it playful. But that if well, you I feel like take Pedro that Sauer attitude, always, yeah, you know, says the same thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it, that yeah. attitude is very helpful, and and I think it's becoming more common. People are more able to learn that you know in the past I think there was a lot more hard goes yep. yeah and a lot more hard training and a lot of people were it was more common people got injured and now I think we understand that the injuries are you know and the fear of injuries are you know keep average students out of the gym but it keeps fighters out of the gym and it, yeah. it keeps it takes people from, fights too. Yeah. from from uh, improving um, and so we you know one of the other topics here that's that uh, ties into this discussion has to do with martial arts as a sport obviously in the past I think one of the things that motivated people to to do these sports was to know whether or not they were you know effective in real war in real fighting and the history of Muay Thai comes from and, and, and a lot of these things come from that but then you know on the other side is like if it becomes too much sport it sort of does lose some of its combative effectiveness and mm -hmm. you know I tend to think that the modern style training is still quite combative, but, you know, a lot of people disagree. So, I don't know, what do you guys think of that? Well, my, my whole take on it is if you are going live, I don't care if you're clinching, if you're doing <clears throat> jiu-jitsu, if you're doing judo, if you're wrestling and competitively, you know, testing each other's skill, you're developing... Yeah, but I just eye poke you. Yeah, that exactly. But here's the thing. <laughs> I would kill but, you. But here's the problem is with, with that. Eyelash, is, I would kill you. Here's the problem with that. You look at all of the, the competition and the testing that's going on, you know, and they have no tests. They have no competition. Yeah. They have no... It's all theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's the big difference. So you could go in there and theoretically be a, a totally sport-oriented person, but Whoop up. you're competitive. And you're, you're, and you're you practice trained. your moves against a resisting opponent. Yes, yeah. and therefore, you know, even though it might seem, you know, theoretically unrealistic, oh, I'd never do that. Well, who's doing it to you? How much time yeah. have they spent in the lab figuring it out, you know? And I always think for me now, how I look at moves and techniques, where I want to spend the majority of my time 
is things that would work in the gi, without the gi, when punches are added, when punches are added, and when you could do it in the street. Yeah. Because that changes things. And I think that gave us a little bit of an edge, too, is the fact that, you know, had certain jobs that you got a lot of competition in the street. Yeah, yeah I mean, tons you know, of it. There's tons yeah. of it. I mean, there is a subculture in martial arts, and especially in the 80s with, like, take Paul Bunak or whatever, where there was street testing of the techniques. Yeah. There was a lot of it. So, it went, like, there is... The, 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 target, the, tar the target environment was great because you got to find street out right test. away what what was working and what wasn't. Yeah. And I looked at that whole entire job as, like, a training opportunity. Yeah. And uh, that was... Did you did you wear a mouth guard at work? I did not. Didn't. No. I heard that... I heard that was encouraged. Back hey, in the day. Yeah. there was when you went Step to bars again. and certain yeah. things. Just have your mouth guard in your pocket. <laughs> well, the world case. was probably more violent too. If you think about the eighty, you know, the 80s. yeah, people there weren't were... so sue happy too. Oh, yeah, no, just, there, there's, there's no videos. There's no yeah cell phones. Uh, yeah, things were kind of. I mean, I remember. There's probably a lot of reasons, but the world was incredibly violent. You know, from my recollection. Yeah, it was. It was uh, height of the kind of the gang situation. So there was so many things going on that, but that really also made us look at the martial arts quite a bit differently than people who didn't have those opportunities to test it. Yeah. And it was like, ah, I would watch out for that because you're going to lose a lot of skin if you do that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and it used to be more about like a style of martial arts too. Like yeah. there Everything was like rooted in like some family tradition or some national tradition as a style, and you know I think what's changed a little bit is it's more about the the training drills or the training from different historical genres of martial arts, um, and that's just people have picked and chosen as things have gotten more connected and, and picked drills from you know that style and this style and start to to be more like a chef and put things together. Well, the um, other thing is you can look and see what's working consistently from match to match, fight to fight, between styles, and stuff that's not working, like in full fights, yeah. is... How, well, I mean, how much, trial, how much trial and error do you think is going on now in, in coaching and fighting? And Honestly, I don't think a lot of them are aware. Like, just having been in fights, I don't know. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot of them. But sometimes I don't think coaches are super... Like, they're just thinking in moves mm -hmm. and not uh, concepts sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this is a whole other uh, can of worms, but coaching and, and actually being a martial artist are two different skill sets, right? Yeah, And definitely. I think sometimes people think because they've gotten to a certain level in martial arts that they can automatically coach. Coach, and that's, yeah. it's yes, you need to know the techniques to do that, but I think sometimes there's the, not enough overlap. It's yeah, just, yeah. There's a there's, there's communication definitely. skills mm -hmm. exactly not yeah. happening there, and it's the same in all sports. You know, you yeah, can be exactly. a great sport. hockey player, but you can't coach to save your yeah you know, anything. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a skill. I think like everything else, like people um, are probably better at it now. You know, before we started, I I, I brought up Tony Dungy versus Bill Parcells, and uh, you know, two two different philosophies, um, and both quite successful. But I, I think what we're seeing more is there's a lot more Tony Jundies nowadays, uh, basically. Enlighten me, because I don't follow. Bill Parcells was super emotional and hot-headed and would scream sure. all the time at people. And Tony Dungy was calm and mm. cool and collected and never screamed and kept his cool and was more positive, I guess. You know, and when I think about, you know, learning, if I think about old-style coaching, I think about a guy like Bill Parcells, mm. and I think about New Scout school coaching in football I think about Tony sure. Sanji. So, you know and you know it's how you how you express that's an American it and, thing, and though, who you know. express it to because you still like in in wrestling programs you still see some of the most you know I was still extremely intense environment yeah whereas then True. you got Penn State and Kale Sanderson's about the most mellow guy on the planet yeah and they both have and really good results both have really well, good results and I think it depends on the, the person too like you might yeah, that, that kind of coaching might work great exactly. for a certain personality type. But well, athletes, athletes. Yeah. Well, okay, so now, gonna... so nowadays though, kids are sensitive. Mm. The millennial, you know, there's this whole thing in Eek. popular culture <laughs> about that. But are they? I mean, well, performance. Is I better. think that yelling though makes people fight fearful. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like I, I think they're, it makes them afraid to take risks, and then it shuts them down, so you end up with one yeah, team champion instead of yeah. multiples. You have, like, when you get to the college level, you're probably a pretty hardened athlete at this point. And so, I don't think it's about uh, being hardened or not, because not every sport is like that. You might get one personality type that, that does well in that. Yeah. But there, there are a lot of different... I mean, but you were saying sports. before, like, you know, okay, this person I can do this with. This person I can be... Yeah, that's a tricky... Hey, that's here, that's the thing about Gable, right? Like he, Gable he was knew. intense, though. He yelled a lot, and he was super intense, but he also knew how to be that kind of that, hey, you got to be here, you got to do this. But he was intense. You watch it, I mean, the highlights, and he was just like, he's the most winningest coach in history Mm -hmm. of wrestling. But but But, when you say that they know, they know that everything he's doing is in their best interest. Oh, yeah, and that was the whole thing. And uh, that's going to make a difference, too. And he wasn't yelling for the sake of yelling. It's interesting because we've had, wrestlers we had rest, a wrestler that wrestled with gable and and um he did like a little bit more intensity i yeah. think in the corner but gable uh, gable would write home back in the day can i slap your son in the face yeah because he knew that's what got him going and other kids he would be like the dad that would rub the shoulders and well, other guys he'd be maybe like, with the new generation that slap in the face not gonna style is not gonna work it's gonna go away <laughs> that's, well, that's there, my well there might be some yeah. Yeah, kids that are sure. that still do well with it but yeah I think it's going to be a smaller and smaller number. I, actually, I was a bit, a bit coach kids wrestling, and so I was uh, studying up on on wrestling coaching. And the per, Greg uh, led me to the Perler DVDs, and he talks about that in there. Yeah. He says that like nine out of ten kids do not need that. There's only no. like yeah. one out of ten kids that. Yeah. Some of them are need. like, yeah, you know, you know, guys will come in here too, and this, for whatever reason, the laws are the, of the jungle are the only thing they understand. Yeah, and getting hit hard is the only thing that yeah that uh, sets them straight. But I think a lot of time. Uh, the screaming stuff is because the result gets too tied into the coach's ego. Yeah, he's yeah. trying to protect himself. The coach yeah. doesn't know what to do. But Definitely. who in here would rather have negative feedback or or positive feedback? Yeah, true. Yeah. True. I don't. Or just, just generally, straight feedback. It just doesn't have to come bundled with emotion. With generally, the negative feedback is kind of a natural thing. You just lost, yeah. or you're just getting hammered, and it's you like, okay, okay, here's the problem. I just That's think the natural do. inclination is to pull back when someone speaks at you negatively you know yeah. so another um interesting development in the world from the 90s until today is that like back in the day we had to go to the bangkok center and rent vhs tapes of thai boxing <laughs> <laughs> and was, couldn't so read thai and if you were lucky there were some there who could read and would pick out a really good um thai boxing match for you but now you know it's just totally connected the whole world is can can study and learn stuff um and specifically in jujitsu, like that has that has totally changed the landscape, right? Well, and almost everything. rapid rapid progress. Yeah. Almost, yeah, almost everything. everything that you're trying to learn. You know, it's like uh, we always tell the students in Thai boxing: if you want to accelerate your learning and understanding Thai boxing, watch really good fights and just watch how they move, watch their and even watch training. You know, you mm-hmm. can Google everything. Same thing with, uh, you know, same thing with jujitsu. It's got every style that's out there, and you can just Google it. Mm-hmm. You can just YouTube it. Yeah, YouTube it. So what are some of the downsides to that, though? Well, the downside is... <laughs> People, People teaching in class. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I saw I think, this on YouTube. What I think the downside could be is this, where... You don't have a, a basic fundamental skill mastered yet, and you're trying to do 15 different passes, and you can't even do one. Or you're trying to do this fancy <clears throat> fake strike, and you, you're having problems landing a jab cross. Yeah. Yeah, friend of May, Mayweather, you know, like people try to box like this. Yeah. yeah. When they don't. It's their hands all down. Yeah. They, have, they don't even have a good stance. You know, and at a, at a, maybe at a begin level, may motivate people, and they watch it, but, you know, if that's how they're trying to learn. The other thing is learning without, or just watching without actually getting in there and drilling. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to do things without actually feeling them. Yeah. You know? You can watch I mean, Martial arts, you can watch as much as you want, but kind of do it. Yeah, you got to feel it. It's like watching clinch or watching grappling. And why did that person just fall over like that? Yeah. yeah. Why, didn't they just, why didn't they watching. just, yeah, why didn't they just step out? You know, 
they don't understand it because they haven't played the game. And that's, you know, bringing back to what Caitlin said, getting in there and just playing and clinching a lot and having fun in there and just learning all the micro movements and micro balancing that you need and little steps and little pulls and pushes that can't be all taken care of on an instructional video. No, Impossible. Right. There's so many small things. Well, and even when you fight, right? Like how often do you watch, sometimes you watch a video of somebody and you're like, yeah, this is going to work on her for sure. Can't, can't believe nobody's done this yet. Then you get in and you figure out why. Yeah. Because it it's not there. Like yeah. it looks mm -hmm. like it is on tape, but, but yeah. it isn't. Or, you know, when you're watching fights, you may not know that so-and-so has a broken foot. That's why they're not taking advantage of a yeah. kick or, or whatever. Hmm. There's always all these little things that you don't, don't pick up unless you get the actual experience. So. Well, one more major cool thing that's happened, uh, you know, with fighting in general is that people can be pro. Now, back in the day, Sean Shirk mm -hmm. had to pay when he first fought. And, yep. you know, even the Thai boxing tournaments back in the day. I mean, I guess they yeah. probably still pay an entrance fee now, but... Yep. But historically, you know, everyone had a job and, and fighting was like what they did for fun at night and on the weekends. And, and now, man, totally different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even uh, even for amateurs, they will sometimes still get a percentage of their ticket sales or they'll at least get their tribal cover. Yeah. Um, so the tournaments, yeah, they're all paying in, but still. Um, and with the visibility, people want to latch on, like there's more sponsorship available. So mm -hmm. at least you're not going in the hole as much as before. Yeah, that's that. So, like, just for one quick second, after the Reebok deal, like, from mm -hmm. what I heard, like, sponsorship money went way down. Yes, it hurt everybody. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Well, and actually... That's not good, but No, it's not. And even before that, the UFC started charging, I think it was 50 grand for anyone to be yes. a sponsor, which really hurt everybody, because wow. you might have, you know, yeah. somebody's crab shack in your hometown that's willing to kick you 1500 bucks every time you fight. They yeah. don't have the money to pay 50000 yeah. in the UFC. Yeah. And, but there it goes for you. Yeah, and I remember, you know, even at the very beginning when Sean, like, fought, he had his first eight-man tournament, paid 85 bucks. We drove down there in a caravan, got our own hotel. But there was also something about that that it drove a very specific type of person to sacrifice that much yes. to keep building and developing because they didn't care about the pay. They cared mm -hmm. about the belt that was going to go around their waist. And that created a different type of fighter. Yeah. Whereas sometimes yes. now... Yep. You know, I'm going to go in and fight for a hundred bucks. Well, you know, people, bucks want to be, know people want to be known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was no they internet back then. They as a fighter yeah, on social Facebook. media. And they, and they, you know, putting the work in is a lot different story. Yeah, it's Facebook it's fighters, different. you know. Caitlin, in your, in your matchmaking, yeah. do you feel like there's, I mean, do you feel like they're that genuine? There's a, yes. There's yeah, a there's lack a sometimes of Yeah, well, genuine. it's not that they, they don't. But because it's like it, it is a viable career path for some, uh, and particularly like the way the women's game just has changed since Invicta came in, it's 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 driven the price up on everybody that wants to have women fight now. Um, but because of that, you have more. You know, I don't want to paint with a broad brush because there are certainly some that are still, what I would call fighters, and then you have athletes, and yeah. they would be doing whatever sport, but they need comfortable conditions to do. Yeah. Um, and it, I don't think they rise to the top in the same way, but yeah. there's definitely more of that, definitely more, uh, fight refusals than there ever would have been. People looking to build themselves instead of just fighting, um, huh. and a little less self-reliance, I think. Yeah. I remember, uh, there was a fight, Dave Manet was, was in it. Half of the fight card got food poisoning. Not one fighter dropped. Yeah. Yeah. See, that would never happen. No, they all <laughs> fought. They're all sick and they're throwing up, and even worse. Yeah. And they all fought anyways. Yeah. The only way I missed fights was if I was in the hospital. Yeah, I mean, it mm -hmm. was no like. That's the yeah, only fight. Oh, I'm not sick a number of times. Oh, big yeah. time. It's because I said I was going to do it. Yeah. 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 And that's what you do it. And, and I see that yeah. way more people not doing it. They back out. And like you said, they're not fighters. They're well, there's a lot of money athletes. on the line now too, right? Like well, I can that's just see it, it like, from both sides. When, like I'm trying to, if I lose, I'm yeah. I'm being punished I'm sure. backwards. And well, like, and it's, it's twice the money if you win. Yeah, yeah. but I think <laughs> that creates really perverse incentives yeah, to not it, fight it does. And, does. To, mm -hmm. and to cheat too. You know, you're worried about ah, if I do this, if I lose. Whereas, and that's a problem with yep. every, how we view winning and worse. losing. Yes, yep. And it makes them fight worse because they're worried about losing. They're like, oh, I just. I can be safe and, and win this boring decision. 
yeah. as opposed really to yeah. Yeah, yeah as opposed to if you were if you were rewarded for the for the actual output that you did for that the, you, spirit, that the you showed. spirit that you showed and that both fighters were you know, pushing you know that was the whole thing about the fight bonus and all this yeah, yeah the UFC I feel like they've done a good job like with the discretionary bonuses although the athletes should get paid more but if the other thing too enough. there's a lot of if you're not in the good yeah. graces mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. You could have one guy that has six, seven losses, and yep. he's still there. You got another person loses once, and they're gone. You yeah. Know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You guys heard what uh, happened to Leslie Smith recently, didn't you? Mm-hmm. So she, she had been with them for a while and given them some really good fights, but she had started this Project Spearhead, which is, or she's very involved. I'm not sure that she started it, but it's working on getting a fighters union. And she'd been lobbying for this in her last fight oh, before yeah. her final, before her contract was up. The girl missed weight, and she wanted to renegotiate her next contract before agreeing to fight the girl. And they said, no, thank you. They paid her her win and show and cut her. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Is. I mean it's, it's crazy business, man. It's like it's Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Game of Thrones, and then, you know, the UFC is like I mean, I the see pinnacle, it, yeah, and they you started, get six grand. They started, mm-hmm. the, right. they started the whole thing, though. Like, they took a huge risk, and, like, I, I look at it from their side a little bit, too, but... Sure. But, I mean, they did, they kind uh, of built the house. That but now, now it's a billion-dollar yeah. corporation. It is. And it so... Is, but I still feel the fighters are, man, compared to what other athletes and other pro sports get, it's... it's your body and not brain fair. is just, mm-hmm. like, being your destroyed brain. for people's entertainment. Yeah, and <laughs> while people kind of forget certain things, like boxing... You might be, you know, in, in a card that Mayweather and and whatever's getting tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. There might be a guy in the undercard getting two hundred fifty bucks a round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So yeah. it's like there's disparity, you know, wherever. Mm-hmm. Unlike you know NFL, you could be on the practice squad and you're like doing okay. Oh, doing well, okay. Yeah, but but hundreds of thousands. Even of dollars. a lot of those guys in the NFL, on average, don't three years. Yeah, they, yeah don't. they just don't have longevity. It's just percentage-wise what the NFL takes in in revenue versus what the athletes get. That's, it just mathematically seems a little bit more fair than, than uh, MMA. Oh, but, yeah, uh, definitely does. The only spot where MMA is uh, good in that area is that women. it's the only sport where women get paid the same. Really? That's, Think of another professional yeah. sport. Yeah, there is yeah, right, like yeah. the same. You get the same media and the same money. Well, do... Is there a good viewer? I mean, like, I like to watch women fight, I guess. Like, it's if they're good, yeah, they're I good. Mean, they're yeah. good, they're good. Invicta, I, I know, has a, a guaranteed half a million viewers per event. Yeah. So do you think that's fest. driven it's by the, the biggest... Is it driven by the market, or... I'm not sure because... exactly. I, I, you know what I think part of it is, is you don't watch... You don't watch uh, fights because you want to see who can jump the highest. Like, yeah. a, like a static thing like that. Yeah. You watch fights because... If, you want to see their heart, right? Like, it's yeah. fun to watch two guys. If they're evenly matched, fight it's fun to, fight. to fight them in a, watch them fight in a bar. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where, it, honestly, True. like, where it is. It's, if it's if it's a if fight, it's a you're good seeing, fight, it's, it's like fun music, to watch. right? Like, mm-hmm. like you know, a female singer. Uh, I like a lot of female singers better than, than guy singers, like Sade, and, you know. Mm-hmm. Right? Who? Sade. Just kidding. Love her. <laughs> <laughs> So, but no, well, I, I think it's it's many things. But but what's funny is what's happening with that is the best guys in jujitsu are staying in jujitsu. The best guys in boxing are mostly staying there. Yeah. But all the best women from other sports are coming into MMA because it's the only place they can make money. Huh. That's fascinating. Except the fan base is totally open to it. Yeah, maybe partly. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like in Thai boxing, you make like a fraction of what the guys are making. Yeah, it's nothing. It's so weird, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How the market is. I think it's it's the market. It's the fan base. It's totally into it. Yeah, and boxing's old. You know, maybe that's part of why it is with boxing. It's different yeah, than sports. I think but that's it. It's a uh, that's been an interesting thing since women have gone to the UFC and not uh, not you know even even other organizations like Bellator are still paying well, but but uh, Ronda was the top earner over there for yeah. quite a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, she brought the viewers in. Like yeah, she did she a lot. Kept the door down. Like yeah, it's really pretty did. amazing. Even even here, I think that you get a lot more um, women interested in MMA and jiu-jitsu after that. We've always had, you know, fairly strong women in Thai boxing in our kickboxing class, but uh, that man that really changed things. It's for, oh, for the better did. a lot. Yeah. Yep. So, well, okay. So that's a good talk, people. 
Greg, you want to take it away? Well, hey. And, wait a minute. Caitlin, you got anything to, to announce or sponsorships or anything you want to say? Shout outs? No, a lot of them are the same. Zebra, Menacing okay. Valor got us. They they uh, took care of all of us down at uh, Glory. Glory this weekend. Cool. So, yeah, nice. shout out to Troy Triple Jones and his recent uh, victory and, uh, and Tom Jenkins for getting in there and, and giving it all he got. Tough fight. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Tough, tough, so, tough fight. Very right. good. Awesome. All right. Hey. Rate and review us on iTunes, share us pod, on pod, the podcast with your friends, and on social media like Facebook and all the other stuff. And contact us at info at academymn.com or on Twitter or Facebook or at Greg Nelson MMA if you want any info and do cool martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> okay.